All right, back. Right, so these um, to give you an example, here we have microvilli. Those you'll find microvilli when you want to increase the surface area when you want to make more surface. So for example, you might find these in your intestine, the cells of your intestines, they have microvilli because your intestines absorb like vitamins and minerals and stuff like that from your food. So you would find those in that case. The cytoskeletons helping to like form that shape. Like why are they shaped like these fingers? And so that would be like the cytoskeleton. Oh, we forgot endoplasmic reticulum. Rough endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins because it's got ribosomes on it. Smooth endoplasmic reticulum makes a sip of coffee for effect. Lipids. But you knew that. So we've covered everything in a animal cell. So let's take a look at plant cells. Increased surface area. That's that must be what it's like to get like a text or a snap from somebody, or DM. Is that what they call it? <laughs> Listen, to me. is that what they call it? All right. I heard a little beep and someone left a message. All right, that's enough leaving messages. Stop. Wait, hold on, I'll think of it. This probably means something different once I say it. And it's gonna make me sound totally old. That's why that's why I'm gonna say it. Stop sliding into my DM. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably not even a thing. It's going to be great for me as I get even older because I'm just going to say shit like that more and more. I'm going to start calling things fire. Like, like today's lecture is fire. Or is it lit? Is lit before fire? This is a plant cell. I know you're all rolling your eyes. Fine. I'm rolling my eyes at you. This is a plant cell. So animal cell, plant cell. Look, you can already see some different things, right? Look at all that green stuff in there. Obviously, that's going to be in there. And But look at the wall, right? No cell wall. Cell wall. No cell wall. Cell wall, cell wall, cell wall. Oh, okay. So, cell wall. That's something different. But the the plasma membrane is also in plant cells, just like you see here. This gray plasma membrane, or they call it a um, phospholipid bilayer plasma membrane, cell membrane whatever you want to call it, it's there in this plant also. It's just right here. It's shoved all the way up against the cell wall. So a cell wall is something that's different in plants. Um, it's made from cellulose. And then you see all these um, chloroplasts in the cell, which, which uh, our cells don't have, right? Because these chloroplasts, this is... The chloroplast is where um, photosynthesis happens. A third thing that you're going to see is different. Um, 
this big vacuole here. So vacuoles just holding um, stuff, liquid, pretty much. So the idea is when you put a lot of liquid in this, a lot of water in this vacuole, that's going to push on everything else. See how it's pushing on the ER and it's pushing on the Golgi and it's, it's like shoving everything up against the wall here. So I see, I see, um, I always imagine animal cells, like the membrane as being like a balloon. You know, a balloon could get like big and pop or it could shrink, shrivel up. This is a balloon also, the gray part, but it's inside of a box, right? So the balloon's not going to pop because the box is preventing it from popping. But if you blow a balloon up enough inside the box, you can see the walls of the box start to um, bulge, right? And that's kind of what plant cells do. They like to be like bulged out like that. They have the, the membrane all the way up against the cell wall. And they like this vacuole to be filled with water. And they like everything shoved up against the walls. A lot of pressure in here. They like to be like that. So when this vacuole loses water, all this stuff, all these organelles start to go back in a little bit, right? So you can imagine like the balloons blown up so big that it's making the walls of the box bulge, right? And then you take some of the air out of the balloon and the box kind of starts to go in, right? <clears throat> so that's what makes the plant, like you'll see the plant and it'll be wilting and, and that's what's going on. And then you'll notice with a lot of plants, when you water it and you wait like 20 minutes, they go back up again. So that's because, you know, they're filling, they're taking that water that you watered it with and, and they're filling their, their vacuole or central vacuole. And that's it. They're pushing everything back up against the cell wall. And all the cell walls are, you know, locked in like Legos. These little things are called plasmodesma. They're just little holes to allow movement from one cell to another. If you look at this one, we've got things not in animal cells. Chloroplast, that's where the photosynthesis happens. The vacuole, don't worry about tonoplast. The vacuole, the cell wall. And then, yeah, I guess we talked about the plasmodesma or plasma desmata, these little holes in between each uh, plant cell. Making sure I don't have anything else. We covered the vacuole. But look how, look, this is an electron microscopy. Look how much of the cell the vacuole takes up, right? So it potentially takes up a huge amount of space. Um, we'll learn about the chloroplast in a subsequent chapter. I think I'm done with this chapter. Anyone have any questions on the chapter on cells? Fine. Let me go into the next chapter. They're asking questions in the uh, in the chat. Are they? Yeah. Why you guys? Oh, really? Can you still barely, barely hear me right now? Because probably because I was like walking back and forth. I don't know what I put for a cell wall. Um, good question. It's a wall around the cell. I'm not going to ask you about what the cell wall is. Well, actually, you know what it is. It's, it's a, a cell wall is made out of 
carbohydrates. It's a polysaccharide. I'm not going to ask you about plasma dysmata. Lindsay, pretty much whatever you say, I'm not going to ask about. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It's it's like, yeah. I don't know how to put it. Yeah, it, it allows them to connect to each other like Legos, and then it allows things to go from one plant cell to another plant cell. Because they don't have, like, a nervous system like we do or blood to move things around really quick. You've got to, they've got to go from cell to cell to cell. When I want to get something from the root up to the leaf, I have to go through those plasmodesma. Okay. What about now? Oh, I'm stretching. No more questions. We can move on that. That shouldn't have been, that should be like a flashcard thing. And I didn't forget about the exam Wednesday being multiple choice. Just in case you're wondering. All right, I'm going to jump into this next chapter. The next chapter talks about just about this cell membrane. That's all it is. How things go in, how things go out. I don't find it that difficult. I don't think you're going to find it that difficult. I want to look at the whole thing. No. Yes. Okay. So this is about the cell membrane. It's a phospholipid bilayer. This is the symbol for a phospholipid. This represents a fatty acid chain, another fatty acid chain. I can't hear you. I don't know. You guys can hear me now, though. I can hear you now. I have the computer in one place. I'm not going to move it around. This is a phospholipid bilayer. All right, so two layers of phospholipid. The the part that's the phosphate group, the the hydrophilic part, faces out of the cell and faces into the cell. So this where it says water down here, this is everything inside the cell. And this other water is everything outside of the cell. So you imagine that line just going all the way around. This looks like some kind of underwater I don't know. It's like there's some like sea worms here, and this is like kelp growing up out of the seabed. I don't know. But this, what this is supposed to be is you see the two layers of phospholipids, and then there's some other things that are embedded in it. There's like some cholesterol here, and don't worry about that, but there are proteins. All these purple blobs represent proteins. And I was telling you in class that it's like two layers of sheetrock. And then 
um, sometimes you have like windows or doors or things like that. And that's what these purple things represent. So there are different, those are different proteins and those proteins have different functions. Like here's an example, like this is a protein that allows some things to go in the cell or out of the cell. This is all the phospholipid bilayer, right? So, um, and this is just kind of like a gate to let things in and out. And actually they have different functions, right? So they'll, they'll transport things through. Sometimes they join cells together. You see here how they're like used to connect these two cells. Um, they used to recognize each other. So they're, they're used for different things. What we're primarily going to talk about is how things get in the cell or out of the cell because cells are selectively permeable. They don't let everything, you know, they don't just let anything in. So when something We've got these two notions here, active and passive, right? So passives here, actives here. That means with energy or without energy. Something that's passive does not need energy. It just happens. You don't need ATP, for example. It just, it just happens. Something that's active, you need energy for it. So we could say that, um, Getting your electricity from solar panels would be like passive because it's coming from the sun, right? So you don't need to generate electricity. And then to make a comparison, the um, if you're going to get electricity from a generator, that would be active, right? Because you got to put it's, it's got to use some kind of fuel, some kind of energy. Same thing with things moving in and things moving out. So passive transport, the main type of passive transport is diffusion. And you need to know what diffusion is. So it's a movement from higher concentration to lower concentration. That's it. It's an area of movement from higher concentration to, to an area of lower concentration. So like here's the membrane. And here's the orange dots. They're going to move from the higher density to the lower density. They're just going to move across until they're equal on both sides, which we're calling it an equilibrium. And that's how things get around your body. So when you breathe in oxygen in your lungs, how does it go from your lungs to your blood? Diffusion. The oxygen just starts moving from your lungs into your bloodstream until the pressure of oxygen is the same on both sides. Once it's the same in your lungs as it is in your blood, that's it. It stops moving. And where, where's all that oxygen going? Well, let's say like some of that oxygen's in your blood and it's going down to your feet. So what makes oxygen go from the blood in your feet into your pinky toe? It's diffusion because the pressure of oxygen is lower in your toe than in the blood in your foot. So it just moves out of the blood and into your toe until it's like equal pressure. So that's, that's diffusion. Higher concentration or higher density, however you want to say it, to lower, higher to lower concentration. It doesn't matter one solute, two solutes what a solute is, although you should know what it is, but just something. <clears throat> so you have diffusion. Sometimes you have diffusion, but you need help. So um, sometimes you need help. Sometimes molecules are um, too large to get through. Right, because you see what's happening with these dots. They're, they're squeezing in between the phospholipids. So some things can't necessarily squeeze between the phospholipids. They need to use a gate. 
think about when you're trying to get into an event at the Superdome, which is not the Mercedes Superdome anymore. What is it? The, I don't know. I can't think of it. The Kentucky Fried Chicken Superdome. Um, because they shouldn't have changed it. I mean, that was kind of cool. It had a Ben sign there, the Ben Superdome. Then they just changed it to something else, whatever. Um, so when you're going there or the Smoothie King Center and you go through those turn styles, turn buckles, right? Some people can't go through there. What if you're pushing a baby, right? What if you have a wheelchair? You can't go through that. So you need, you need to go through the gate. That would be facilitated diffusion. Things that are ions, like things that have a charge, positive charge, negative charge, they can't just go into a cell or out of a cell. They have to use facilitated diffusion. So things that are too big, things that, that have a charge, things that are positive or negative, and things that um, if you're going to move a large amount. So when you have like a whole bus full of kids, you could make them all go through the turnstile, but it's easy just to open the gate and let the whole bus of kids go through, right? So we do that. Sometimes we want to move a lot of water. So we have a special gate just for water to move a bunch of it in a cell or out of a cell. Water will move. Like you can, water will just seep through here. But sometimes we want to move it a little bit faster than that. So we'll open a special gate. It's called like an aquaporin, and that'll move it a lot faster. Um, all right, so that's passive transport. You have passive transport, diffusion, or facilitated diffusion. It's both diffusion. It's both going to move from higher concentration to lower concentration. These orange triangles are going to keep moving through until you get about, I don't know, six on each side, you know, whenever they're equal. <clears throat> but here's active transport. So this is doing the opposite. This is going against diffusion. In fact, we call this the concentration gradient. It's kind of a good term to know. When I go from higher to lower, that's called moving along the concentration gradient. This is going here against the concentration gradient. They sh the, the concentration gradient should be that these green squares move out, but no, they're moving in. So in order to do that, you need an energy source. You need usually ATP because this, this is essentially a pump, right? So you got to pump it. You know, when, when, you know, water would naturally flow from all the waterways around the parish into the parish because that's diffusion. It wants to come in and be the same level as the, as the water or like Lake Pontchartrain wants to come in and flood Kenner. And how long is it going to flood Kenner until Kenner is the same depth as Lake Pontchartrain? Do you need any energy for that? No. You've got to put a hole in the levee. It'll do the rest. You don't have to pump the water in. If you want to get it out, you have to pump it out because you're going against diffusion. You're going against the concentration gradient. So we need energy for that, right? We need electricity to turn on those pumps to pump all the water out. That's kind of like active transport. And your body does that. Your body pumps things in or out, depending on what it's trying to do. So that's active transport. Active transport goes against diffusion or against the concentration gradient. Questions so far? This is an example. This is a better example. Okay. 
this cell, <clears throat> here's the inside of the cell, here's the outside of the cell. This cell here wants to get sugar. Remember, this is a, one of the disaccharides. It wants to get sugar into the cell, but sugar won't, it won't go in. It's not working by like diffusion. So we're going to have to drag it in. So what happens is that we're going to pump these. Remember in H plus, we call them, it's a hydrogen ion. So we call it a proton. So we're going to pump these protons out of the cell. So let's say you've got 50 protons inside, 50 protons outside. You pump those 50 protons out of the cell. Now you have 100 protons outside and you don't have any inside. So 50 of them want to go back in. And they do, but when they go back in, they're going to take a molecule of sucrose with them. So we call that like a co-transport. We're, we're, um, we're using active transport and passive. We're pumping them out, but for a reason. They're going to turn around and come back in again. When they come back in, they're going to grab the thing we want to grab. So that is going to, that principle is going to be behind cell, um, cell respiration. Cell, the, the cellular respiration is how we make ATP. And this idea, this slide is like one of the ideas behind how we make, how we take the ADP and put it together with the P. <clears throat> okay, questions on active versus passive transport. Uh, I just have one question. If the purple things are still proteins or not, or if that even matters. Yeah, they're proteins. Okay. It, I don't know why this book colors them purple. That's not what they look like. It's not their color. Mm -hmm. It's just it's just trying to show you. All right, thank so you. Think, yeah, think... They always think of like when, when you cell membrane, like there's proteins all through your cell membrane and think of them pretty much as four different jobs. Um, although this is not all they do, but they're, they're, um, they're gates. They're like doors to let things in and out. Um, they are identifiers. So like, um, like if you ever see someone's, like a like a plaque outside someone's house, like where the Millers, like that's that's a protein or a cell. We have those. All of our cells have those. Oh, this is Klaus's cell. Um, so that's the second thing that we do with them. Um, a third thing is that uh, we use it as a pump. So, you know, when you have like a waste product or something, you just pump it out. So. So they they uh, they act as a pump. Did I say four things? Oh, uh, you said the gates, identifiers, and pump. Yeah, so, they're like you. gates, and sometimes these purple things are hanging out. They're not like embedded, but they're hanging out on the outside of the cell, and they just identify your cell as belonging to you. That's the whole thing behind your immune Ooh. system. Okay. Okay, now this, this is talking about osmosis, and osmosis is the diffusion of water. Water also goes from a higher concentration to a lower concentration of water. And that just kind of makes sense, you know. If it, it wants to move from wherever there's more of it to wherever there's less of it. But it does something, it acts a little bit different than other um, substances. Water likes to follow solutes. And remember, a solute is the thing that you put in the liquid that dissolves. So I was using the example of um, Kool-Aid, I think, when we were talking about it. The Kool-Aid powder is the solute, and the water is the solvent. So 
the, the solute is anything that you're going to put inside something that's just kind of there and it's going to dissolve. <clears throat> Water likes to follow solutes. And a, and a good example is um, sodium. Water follows sodium. People that are on high blood pressure, they're supposed to watch their, or they have high blood pressure, they're supposed to watch their sodium intake. Because you don't want to keep sodium in the body. When you keep sodium in the body, you keep water in your body. And when you keep water in your body, you have more blood, which means you have higher blood pressure. So some of the medicines for blood pressure make you pee out sodium because they want the water to follow the sodium out. So when you pee that out into the toilet, they want the water to follow because they want to keep you dehydrated, really. You're getting, you're sort of dehydrated. And that's going to keep your blood volume down and that's going to keep your blood, blood pressure down. And so a lot of people will call them like water pills, um, but we can use sodium to manipulate how much you pee. So if we can find a way to get rid of more sodium, pee's gonna follow it, or, or water's gonna follow it. You keep sodium, water's gonna stay with it. So water stays with solutes. Another example of a solute is like albumin. There's different solutes, right? The sodium's kind of the main one. Um, in the lab, we'll do a lab experiment on this Wednesday. Um, we'll probably use sugar. We'll use whatever I can find underneath the counter. Probably salt. I saw some salt water already made. So it's kind of weird because you would think that water wants to go wherever there is less salt, right? If you're water, you want to go to like pure water. You wouldn't want to go to a bunch of salt water because you think salt water is like pretty dense, right? So you wouldn't want to go there, but that's exactly what water does. Water goes, so if water has a choice between two, like if water's in the air and there's two glasses of water, one of them's just regular glass of drinking water and one salt water, the water in the air is going to go into the salt water every time. So just got to trust me on that. Well, I could try to explain it. You have a classroom. It's an analogy I usually use. You have a classroom with like 25 students in it, right? And they're all, you know, they're all sitting in the desk. You guys fill your desk. We diffuse when we go sit in rooms, right? When you sit in rooms, you have people sit in the back and people sit in the front. All the nerds move to the front desk and everyone else moves to the back because they don't want to be noticed. Then you start filling that middle section, right? So it's not like you have 25 desks and you're all in the corner of the room and the rest of the room's empty, right? It's just like an elevator, right? We diffuse. We don't all stand next to each other where the buttons are. We spread out in the elevator. It's a very natural thing for humans to um, diffuse. But what if somebody um, like super famous got on the elevator? Well, then you're not going to diffuse, are you? You're all going to be up on that famous person trying to get a selfie with them to show that you have an interesting life on Instagram. Um, same thing for a classroom. So imagine you had a classroom with 25 students in it, and then, then you have a classroom next door with 25 students. So they're all sitting in the seats like normal, but in one of those classrooms, a famous person walks in and sits in the back. Well, you're all going to go to the back, right? So now I walk by that classroom and I see everybody is around some famous person and they're not sitting in their, they're not sitting in their chairs. So now I've got a choice. What classroom do I want to go hang out in? Do I want to hang out in the class where everyone's sitting at their desk? Or do I want to go to the other class that also has 25 kids, but they're all in the back of the class. So all those desks are open now. So that's what salt is. Salt's like a famous person. When salt comes in, all the water crowds around it and it, it actually makes more room because everybody's crowded around. I know now that I'm listening to that, 
water follows solutes. Just don't forget that. All right. And so now with that, we have these terms, hypotonic, hypertonic, and there's a third term called isotonic. The word tonic just means how much solute. So hypertonic means it has more solute. Hypotonic means it has less solute. Remember, water goes to wherever there's more solute. So water always goes to hypertonic. These words have to be used kind of in comparison. I can't say that this coffee is hypertonic. Compared to what? Is it hypertonic compared to um, a pumpkin spice latte? Hell no. This coffee, because this is just black coffee, um, it would be hypotonic because uh, all it is is coffee, right? And then that stuff you all get from the coffee house, that 550 calorie drink, that's got a shitload of sugar in it and fat. Um, it's got a bunch of solute in it, right? So, but if I were to say that this coffee is hypertonic compared to water, that would be right because water has nothing in it and my coffee has coffee in it. So compared to just regular drinking water, this would be hypertonic and the water would be hypotonic. So you just, it's just a comparison. And then isotonic means when they're the same. So if you have a bottle of drinking water and another bottle of drinking water, they're the same. This matters in a hospital setting because whenever you put stuff into someone's blood, whenever they stick an IV in you, and they start giving you fluid or anything, it has to be isotonic, right? They can't, because your blood has some salt in it, right? So you can't put regular water into your blood because your blood's salty, a little bit salty, and the water's not at all salty. So the water is hypotonic, your blood is hypertonic, you're screwing it up. You start introducing more um, water to your blood, you're gonna, you're gonna burst. Why? Okay, pretend this is a cell in your blood, and you put water into the, like you inject water into the, uh, into a vein, instead of instead of IV fluid. IV fluid is isotonic. Instead, you injected just water. So this plasma in your blood is about 0.9% salt. Same thing here. Inside your blood cells, 0.9% salt, right? It's balanced. When you put regular water, now you're diluting the plasma. Instead of being 0.9%, it's going to be like lower. So like, let's say it's 0.5%, right? So now you made your plasma hypotonic and you made inside of your cells are hypertonic you've thrown off that balance so all the water out here wants to go into the cell so it starts going in and it bursts your cell well the opposite could be true if you were to take an iv bag and instead of instead of it being 0 0.9 percent salt you made it like two percent salt well now you've made your plasma your blood plasma all salty compared to the cell so all the water leaves the cell and it goes out into the plasma so your blood cells would shrink so we keep for our body we keep everything normal we keep it isotonic we keep the same amount like salt for example we keep the same amount of salt inside of our cells versus outside of ourselves because we don't want things moving like we don't want water to leave the cell or stay in the cell. <clears throat> that didn't make sense. You know what I'm saying? You don't want it to burst, which we're using the word lice, or shrivel up. Plants are a little different. Remember, we were talking about that vacuole, right? So they like, they like being turgid. They like being in a hypotonic solution. They don't want you to water the plant with salt water. Just regular water is fine because they've blown up that balloon 
against that box. So that balloon's not going to pop, right? But us, no, it will, it'll pop, right? But they have this same balloon inside here. It's just, it's all the way up against the box. And we could do this, um, we could sell, like, um, I do it sometimes with um, just onions, like those uh, purple onions. I can scrape, um, I'll scrape like a thin layer, and then you could see all the, all the onion cells, they're, they're purple, and they look like bricks. So it just looks like a bunch of purple bricks, right? And then we'll add a drop of salt to the slide, and you could see the purple start to pull away now. They don't look like bricks. You can see all this white space in between. Maybe we'll do it um, on Wednesday because it's not really a lab. It's just you could see it. So hypotonic, hypertonic. Hypertonic has more solute than hypotonic. Water always moves to the hypertonic state. Water always goes to wherever it's more salty, which is counterintuitive, right? It doesn't make sense. But that's what it does. So water always moves, or osmosis always happens from hypotonic to hypertonic. This is the last thing for this chapter, and I might just even end it. I'll probably end the class. I mean, it's super early, but I, I don't want to jump into the other chapter. I mean, we're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule now. This is the last thing from this chapter. Cells, how a cell will eat. All right, there's different ways to do it. Sometimes you can open a gate and let things in. But sometimes a cell will just surround something and eat it. And we talked about this first one already. So all three of these are called endocytosis. Endo meaning in, cyto meaning cell, so like in the cell. Or the cell's taking something in. <clears throat> so this is the, a very common way for a cell to take something in through phagocytosis. All right, so this is cell eating. All right, the cell, you just surround it and engulf it and drag it in. This wall, this plasma membrane, is essentially a lipid, right? So it's like oil, right? So it's no, there's no problem like closing this off and butting it off and making like a, like a container. But plasma, I'm sorry, phagocytosis is cell eating. And sometimes a cell will drink so in that case, we call it penocytosis. It takes a gulp of fluid. If it's trying to get in some, some type of glucose or something, it might gulp it in. That's not the usual way to do it, but cells will do that. So wait, what would you have put for uh, the first Penocytosis? Thing? Cell drinking. Phagocytosis, cell eating. Penocytosis, cell drinking. Phagocytosis happens like all day long. I mean, already this morning you've, you've breathed in dust mites, maybe some pollen. You've probably eaten some bacteria or something on your food. Like, it's always there. It's always there. It's just that it doesn't make us sick because we have these cells called phagocytes, and they went and they ate it. Like the dust mite or the, you know, whatever it is that we breathed in this morning when we woke up, um, whatever we ate, whatever we got on our fingers and got into our mouth, the phagocytes, these cells called phagocytes, they just went and they ate it. So, like, you're good. You're not going to, you know, they, they're protecting you. We, we never feel sick and we never notice it. It's just part of our lives, right? We, we're putting stuff in our bodies that don't belong in our bodies all day. And these cells are just taking care of it. It doesn't have to be, you know, I mean, obviously sometimes 
you know, you get something like coronavirus in you and it's that's too much for a phagocyte, right? They're not going to handle that. But the normal day-to-day -day stuff, yeah, the phagocytes eat it. So anyway, phagocyte, cell eating, phagocytosis, phenocyte, cell drinking. You're not going to really see that that much in reality. And then this last one, receptor-mediated endocytosis. So it's endocytosis. You have something going into the cell. It's just something very particular. That's what we mean. You know, that's what receptors are for. Receptors have certain functions. So um, you have a gland in your neck that's the thyroid gland. Some of you have heard of it because maybe you don't make enough thyroid hormone. But your thyroid gland regulates your metabolism. So, um, and, and to make these hormones that regulate your metabolism, it needs iodine. And it's pretty much the only place in your body that uses iodine. So when you eat shellfish or whatever, um, you get iodine. That iodine ends up in your blood. Okay, well, the question is, how does the iodine know to go to my thyroid gland in my throat? Why doesn't it go to my spleen? or my big toe? Why doesn't it all go to my kneecap and just stay there? You know, why, why doesn't it just keep circulating through my body? Because the iodine, in this case, are look, look like purple triangles. And my, my um, thyroid gland has the receptors. It's the only part of my body that has the receptors. So that iodine is floating past my heart and other places and it's getting ignored you know once it travels by the iodine then it's got the receptor and it like locks it in and then it drags it in so receptor mediated endocytosis uses a receptor and it's only for specific things like phagocytes they eat whatever, right? This might be sugar. This might be a piece of bacteria. It could be anything, and the phagocytes are eating it. But same thing with drinking. You don't know what you're drinking. The cell's just drinking. So, but receptors, they were looking for one specific thing. That's why you, that's why you grow hair in all your private places and not on your eyeball. Because under your arms have the receptors. Your eyeball doesn't have the receptors, thank God. It's all um, about it's all about receptors. Yeah. I was just gonna ask a like just a curious question. So like uh for someone that doesn't have a thyroid, uh the medicine I take daily, uh the receptors is what tells it what to do. Because I always wondered how that worked. Like how I'm able to, you know, still do normal things. I don't have a thyroid at all. How you don't have a thyroid? No. Like how you don't have a thyroid problem, you mean? No, I don't have a thyroid. Like it got cut out. Oh, so you want to know how did you get to the point where it had to get cut out? Like, I know I'm just wondering, like, so I take a pill every day for the rest of my life. So I'm asking, like, so the receptor mediated one would play a part in that or if, if it's too much of a question i can ask no no, no i get it you're taking you're taking uh you're taking either synthroid or levothyroxine right yeah so it's it's mimicking the so what happens when we're talking about, like when i was talking about this receptor this receptor is for iodine and the cell the thyroid cell is going to take the iodine and make not synthroid, but we'll call it, it's called T3 and T4, right? So it yeah, makes I know what that is. Form. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's making T3 and T4 out of the iodine. Well, yeah, for you, that doesn't even matter, right? Because you don't need it because you don't have a thyroid hormone. You don't. So what's happening is instead of the cells making the hormone, you're just taking it in the form of a pill. Oh, okay. 
So I mean, that's what, like synthroid is like synthetic thyroid medicine. I mean, so you don't even care. It doesn't matter for you about receptor. There is no receptor mediated cytosis in your body, not for iodine. Okay. That's interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And um, here's like an example of, of, of positive and negative, like, the iodine usually that goes into these um, these these pills or into thyroid hormones in general are the iodine's negative, right? So when you're taking your medicine, that's a negatively charged medicine. So they should have told you, don't eat it with food. Yeah, I have to wait like an hour before I can eat or drink yeah. anything but water. Because your milk's going to be probably have some positively charged stuff in it and then the negatively charged medicine is going to bind to that. And it's, mm -hmm. it's the hormones. And I used to always wonder, like, I'm hungry now. Why do I have to wait? <laughs> so that was cool learning that. In, uh, one of yeah, the they don't want the negative medicine to bind all the positive stuff. And then it's like you never even took it. You're just going to yeah. it's gonna act like food and it's not going to be in your blood. And you're just going to end up pooing it out. That's it. Okay. So I think that's the end. Does anyone have any questions on any of this stuff? We're using all these, these ideas from this chapter is going to go into a chapter next week that we talk about. So, I mean, they're not hard, so you don't have to have a question. Just, you know, make sure you know what diffusion is. And make sure you know the difference between active and passive, right? Active is going against diffusion. Um, water moves from a hypotonic to a hypertonic solution. All right. That's it. I mean, we're, we're done pretty quick today. I don't want to jump into the next chapter because... So for the test, I, th we're, I guess we're looking at two, two chapters. Um, cells. And, uh, well, hold on, because we have questions on. Um, oh, no. All right. Cells. This chapter here. And metabolism. So you got three chapters, metabolism, cell, cell membrane. I do not have, I only have metabolism up right now, I believe. So I need to add, I don't have a video on the cell and cell membrane, except for this one that I've just made. I don't have like another type of video. I've got some PDF, like a Word document that I wrote. I could put that up, but I mean, yeah. So essentially this video and um, and the video on metabolism. Cells eat or drink or do both. Higher to lower concentration. These are probably old. Oh wow, yeah, I said a half hour ago. All right. If you don't have any questions, you can um, drop off. Some of you were meeting me today. That's at 1.30 unless you need to reschedule that and stay on with me. I have a question. Um, yeah. Can I come for 1.30 like everyone else and um, make up the test, the quiz that I missed? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I have to stop recording.